Paul Bryan. Thank you. Making membership memorable. I only thought of that with the car driving over here. It's the beauty of technology. Hands up, those of you who are in a club who appoint men mentors. Okay, there's just a couple of clubs who don't. Hands up, those of you who have been a mentor. Most of you, that's great. Before we go into uh, the, speech, the talk proper, I'm gonna play you just a little bit of a video. Now I apologize that uh, I didn't bring a speaker, so I'm not sure how well this is gonna work and whether you'll be able to hear it, but fingers crossed, we'll see if it works. And I'll turn the volume up. Hi, this is Don Howe, and the topic for this golden nugget is mentoring. Socrates mentored Plato. Plato mentored Aristotle. Aristotle mentored Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great almost conquered the whole world. Mentoring is basically training or discipling others, and anyone can be a mentor. You don't need to be perfect in order to be an effective mentor. As a mentor, you'll teach both skills and character. Skills are usually taught intentionally, while character is usually caught or taught unintentionally. You should only mentor a person who is ready willing and able to grow. I like to say, look for a fat person. F A T. That stands for faithful, available, and teachable. Effective mentoring requires a customized growth plan that fits the individual and both the mentor and the one being mentored should be on a personal growth program. When you're mentoring and you want to teach a specific task, there's a four step process that you should follow. Number one, I do the task, you watch and learn. Number two, we do the task together. Number three, you do the task and I watch and I offer feedback. And number four, you do the task. That's how How Insurance Services has designed their mentoring program. In order to be a good mentor, you've got to expect results. The key to exponential growth is to make sure that you don't just mentor anyone. If you want to grow exponentially, make sure that you mentor someone who will in turn mentor others. If you want to be successful, you've got to be teachable. You've got to be a lifelong learner. Do you read good books? Do you listen to good audio? Do you observe what's happening around you? Do you take good notes? Do you write down the thoughts that you have? One of the keys to learning is to not write down what the teacher says, but to write down the thoughts that you have while the teacher is speaking. In other words, take what the teacher is saying and figure out how to apply it to your own life. I expect you to take notes. As you listen to these gold nuggets, I expect you to write down any thoughts that might come to your mind and I expect you to grow. This is because I believe that you are a winner and given enough time, you will win. Yes, you are a winner.
Okay. Now, not all of that is, is totally applicable to a Toastmasters mentor, but it gives us a general picture. Now, mentors, mentorship as such doesn't just happen. In a club situation, you have to plan for it. Who does the planning? The committee. The committee. No, not just the VP education. It should be a committee job. Why? Because it involves more than just one person. It involves everybody in the club. And the committee is the best place to set up a plan as to how the mentoring is going to be done, to make sure that a mentor, a suitable mentor, is appointed to every new member. And bear in mind that that is a relationship. And therefore, the mentor and the protege need to be a good match. Now, I have a handout here, which you can pick up on the way out, which is a template which you can use for giving to your mentors and also a checklist that they can follow when they go through their mentorship. Don't take it as gospel. Amend it to suit your particular club and your particular circumstances. And there is one slight, I don't know whether you call it a mistake, but I put pathways into the second meeting. Well, really, pathways should be going into the first meeting. <coughs> so, let's talk about the first meeting. What's the most important thing that the mentor needs to establish at that first meeting? No, we're talking about now the mentor needs to get information from the protégé. So what should he, the mentor find out first? Goals. Why is the member there? What is the member's personal objectives? And what else can you think of? Skills that they already have. Skills that they already have, very much so. What's their current skill level? What do we do in Toastmasters Club? Why do we <laughs> applause all the time? Why is it Madam this, Mr. that, and so on? We need to explain that because that can be very strange to a new member. Anything else that we should be talking about? Exactly. What's your, what do you no, we said what you're going to get out. It's, it's what the club can give to you as a new member. Right? How is the club going to meet your personal objectives? And then, of course, the last thing that should be in there is, of course, pathways. We must be introducing pathways. Now, Paul gave a fantastic presentation just now. Take that on board and make sure that the new member understands how to access Pathways and understands what Pathways is all about. That is key, in my opinion, to getting the member into the system with the minimum amount of stress. We need to give them an update in the next meeting to encourage them to come back. Excellent one, yes. If you didn't hear that, give them the date of the next meeting. So to make sure they come back. But we assume that they've actually paid their money. And once they've paid their money, there's a good incentive for them to come back. <laughs> but good point. <clears throat> OK. We now assume that they've been to uh, one meeting or two meetings, and they're beginning to get into the idea of Toastmasters. So what should we do now? OK. But uh, what do they know about roles? Not a lot, I would say. Well, we're assuming that the mentor has been appointed, and this is the mentor's second meeting with the new member. Uh, yes, but that's, as we know, Toastmasters is self-driven, is self therefore it's up to the member to set their own targets. We're not 
kind. Of, we can encourage them to set their own targets, certainly. <coughs> excellent, excellent. That came number four on my list. <laughs> but yes, make sure that they have a handbook and they understand the contents of that handbook. The handbook, if you don't know and if your club is not using it, it's a fantastic resource prepared by, mainly by Mary Walsh and Sharon O'Neill in Blarney Club, but it has been sent out to every club. Give it to every member, please. It's an excellent resource. Okay, when I joined Toastmasters first, <coughs> I thought it was just, well, I knew there were loads of clubs, but I didn't understand anything about Toastmasters, what Toastmasters was. So it's a good idea in the early stages, just to, not to explain to, in great detail, but just to let them know that Toastmasters is not just the club, that there are la layers of support going all the way up to the international board. Now, <coughs> explain the area, that there is an area of three, four, five clubs, six clubs maybe, and a division above that, and a district above that. That's as far as I would go. Explain that whilst there are jobs that you can do within the club, and those of course are the, the club committee jobs, which again you should explain, but there are also opportunities to move out of your club into an area position or into a divisional position. You're not just restricted. Now, Many members won't be interested in, in going outside of the club, but there are going to be the odd ones who actually have a, an ambition to go on the leadership path. I don't know about you folk, I didn't know anything about the leadership side when I joined Toastmasters. It sort of came up and it tapped me on the shoulder and uh, encouraged me to go on the leadership path. And of course, the very important thing is the icebreaker. You can either just be encouraging and say, well, the icebreaker is you to explain yourself and introduce yourself to your club. Or you can be a bit more proactive and say, well, write your speech and let me see it. And I'll come back and I'll give you some pointers of maybe things that you can do which will make the speech better. And the first thing that I say to any member when talking about their icebreaker, which is a five a four to six minute speech, write it down in 600 words. If you use 600 words, that's speaking at 100 words a minute, you will not go over time. Now if you're like me and you write your speech and then you try and remember it and you go off in a tangent and you get the odd laugh if you're lucky, which might go on for longer than you anticipate. 600 words will ensure that you are within or near the six minutes. Whereas if you say, well, I speak at 135 words a minute, which is pretty well average, and therefore I can have 750 or 800 words, I guarantee you, you will go over time. So this is simple stuff that you can give to your mentee for your uh, protege from your own experience. So some like my latest mentee, protege, I can't get used to saying the word protege. <coughs> he did his uh, icebreaker at his second meeting and he didn't need any help or advice. So what he needed was to know a lot more about Toastmasters, about the whys and the wherefores of what we do in meetings, and about the Toastmasters organization, because he's already quite a good speaker. <coughs> Ongoing uh, or support, should we say. We're gonna support that member, we're gonna advise them, we're gonna give the guidance, and we're going to give them help when they ask for it. Now, generally speaking, what Toastmasters says is that your mentorship should go on for the first three speeches. Well, that's up to you, isn't it, really? Some protégés need help for more than just the first three speeches. Some don't even need that. After their icebreaker, 
they're up and running. That's up to you to establish with your protege. But they do say that your mentorship should have an end. So what happens ongoing? Think about your own Toastmasters journey. What did you do after you got to your competent communicator or your level one, level two pathways? And you start going into the more serious speeches or even going into contests, competition. You need help. Well, you may not need help or you may not think that you, you need help, but there are always going to be others either in your club or in other clubs who are more experienced than you who can give you feedback which is going to benefit you and improve your speech making. I've had three or four different mentors during my Toastmasters journey <clears throat> and each of them have given me either on the leadership style or on the speaking, style, speaking side have given me extra help and a mirror that I can see myself in a different way. So, this is not so much for your initial mentorship, but make sure that your members are aware that all they have to do is to ask one of the more experienced members for help, and we'll give it. We'll give it freely, because we're Toastmasters. Maybe you might have one or two questions which we can <coughs> bat around. So, does anyone... Sorry, Gavin. Does anyone have any questions before I wrap up? Yeah, can you just fill yes. us in on some of those titles? The talk show for talkers, is it something you do yourself? Or, um, okay, this is, this is pure blatant advertising. Okay. The talk show for talkers is a weekly podcast in four parts published at 4 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. What's the time now? It's 25 past three. It'll be published in 35 minutes. It is hosted by Ted Melanfi, down the back there, whose idea it was in the originally, six years ago. Yeah, six years ago. God, we've been going a long time. Uh, and uh, Paul Imani, Area Director 3, and myself, and I produce and edit the show. We cover absolutely everything to do with public speaking, confidence, leadership, anything to do with public speaking.